All right, everyone, it is interview time, and we are here with repeat guest, Dr. Allison Ash. We will also be referring to her as Dr. Allie, but Dr. Allison Ash, everyone, she's awesome. She's at least been on our show, I don't know, I want to say at least like four to five times. That seems right. Yeah, you might, maybe you're, you've been on our show more, more than anyone. It's possible. Wow. wow that's yeah. a badge of honor. I'll gladly yeah. take. Yeah. Yeah. We, yeah well, we, uh, we absolutely love you. And you always have so many wonderful gifts and gems to share with. And she's in our book too. And you're in our book. Yes. 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 And so anytime you come to us, like, I have a topic. Yep. Well, let's get you on the schedule because you're phenomenal. So, so wow. happy to have you back. This episode is uh, how to have endless hot intimacy in long-term relationships, also known as LTRs. And we are excited to talk about this because um, a lot of folks could probably use some information on this topic. So even though you've been on our show many times, can you please tell us how you, how you got to where you are today in the field of sexuality? Sure. Yeah. Well, let's see. I grew up in a family where intimacy wasn't very modeled in any way, shape or form. And so I think intimacy is a skill. And so many of us have to learn it through trial and error. And that is definitely my story. And when we're learning something through trial and error, that leaves up so many opportunities for pain and trauma and suffering and embarrassment and shame. And I really spent so much of my young adulthood figuring out what it meant to me to be sexually empowered, which I think is knowing yourself, your wants, your needs, your boundaries, your desires, your fantasies, and then feeling confident and empowered to express them. And that personal journey took me on to my professional journey where I got my PhD in sociology, specializing in sex and gender, doing all sorts of academic research on the orgasm gap and college hookup culture and queer identities and trans experiences. And after a very long PhD program, I decided that I wanted to take everything that I was learning and discovering outside of academia and put it into a more experiential format so that I could actually help empower other people to have positive sexual and intimate experiences. And so then I pursued the Hakomi model of psychotherapy, which is actually how I met you, mm -hmm, yeah. Amy, mm -hmm. and um, somatica model and some trauma coaching and therapy, and really just wanting to develop the skill set to be able to support folks to do both the skill building intimacy requires, but also the emotional processing of all of the things that we've experienced that can show up that can become a barrier or obstacle to actually being able to implement those intimacy skills. Yeah. Well, you also, you have such a long, I mean, your bio is so impressive. You have such a long accreditation, I don't know, of, of things that you've accomplished and done and studied and Stanford. I mean, hello, that's like a lot there. I mean, that's not, are you still teaching? As I well? am. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's amazing. And speaking of teaching every time you're on the show, all, all six times plus, uh, however many a times, Five it, million times it's been, it's, I always learn something. So I'm excited about this topic because a lot of folks that listen are in long-term relationships, the LTRs, as you say. So very important question here, Allison, Dr. Allie, why do couples stop fucking? Ah, like oh what are goodness. some of the common <laughs> obstacles that contribute to couples losing the spark over time? There are so many intimacy blockers, as I call them. It could be things like pressure that develops over time getting stuck in other roles like co-parents, co-workers, cohabitators, and not relating to each other as lovers, chronic fighting, bickering, ling lingering resentments, getting stuck in your head, insecurities and shame, grief. And sometimes that grief could be around situational factors, but also it could be around like the loss of NRE or when things felt easy. Wait, will or you say different. what NRE is? Because some people might not know what that is. Sure. Yeah, Sure. <laughs> yeah. New relationship energy, which is at the first six to 12 months of a relationship when your brain is flooding your body with these intoxicating, yummy chemicals and hormones like endorphins, oxytocin, serotonin, or pronephrine. And all of these chemicals make you feel like you're high and it creates a libido that is oftentimes much more accessible. You know, that's when like the quickie sex and just ready and rearing to go. And then the reality is for couples in long-term relationships, desire isn't this constant initial state, I feel desire, then we hook up. What's 
much more often the norm is desire something that starts to build as an experience is unfolding. And I think one of the main issues is, is that couples aren't creating the opportunities to see if desire can build. And they're just waiting for themselves to organically feel desire without that chemical boost that NRE provides. Mm. Yeah, it's like that. Like we shouldn't schedule sex and it should be spontaneous and we should just feel like these natural things for each other. And if we don't, then there's something wrong with us. But we but if, but if we actually scheduled it or, or if we actually like worked at it, then there's something wrong with us too. Oh my God. So everyone loses no matter what. Yeah, I totally get that. Like waiting for the thing to happen. I'm really curious because you talked about the pressure in sex. And I'm curious about the like yeah, the the whys and the like. Where does this come from? So, what are some of the ways couples experience pressure around sex, which I think is really common, uh, as you said? And where does it come from? And how can they overcome this intense feeling? Yeah, pressure is one of the biggest obstacles that folks experience around sex and long term relationships. And in fact, we did a whole podcast episode on this. So, listeners, go out listen to mm-hmm. the previous Shameless Sex episode for a really big deep dive. But I think it's important to to bring it up here and now because it is such a libido blocker. And I think pressure can develop when we have mismatched libidos. One person has a higher libido than the other. And of course, this is fluid throughout a relationship cycle. So sometimes that's a static dynamic, but sometimes that shifts and changes as situations change. It can also happen when there's differences in desire. People want different things out of sex. Uh, Sometimes it happens when we start to relate to sex as something that's something we're obligated to do or a chore. And then we are no longer having sex for us. We're having it to fulfill somebody else's wants and needs. And then pressure as well as resentment can really accrue over time. And oftentimes what happens is when the ways that we relate to sex or our sex drive shifts and change, we can start to catastrophize. We can start to make stories up that something is wrong with me or my partner or the relationship. And that can also result in a lot of pressure. Mm. pressure is not great we just so we april and i april last week was in the studio not the studio but um we were reading our audio book uh for for our upcoming book or the audible or audio version of it and i uh just read your part by the way more, more so about fantasy did you do her voice no i'm bad what? with voices oh, i don't even know how to do your voice so i was reading your part there like some of your quotes which you could have made her sound like a bro like yo bro Bro, I'm just kidding. <laughs> fantasies are awesome. She did not say it that way. Um, but but also one thing that was in there, which I don't think was from you, as was from us, which was uh, talking about like pressure is good for G spot G areas, prostates, massage, but not usually for a lot of other things in sex, unless it's like your jam that gets you gets you off. Like oh yeah, pressure me. But like for everything else, it's a little bit like this is overwhelming and it's hard for me to be in my body and to like connect with you because it's a mind fuck. Right. So anyways, I, yeah, I I just felt you yesterday. I was like, Alice, (laughs) it's good information in there. I just said, yeah. And I just sat through this last weekend, this conference, and it was the science behind sex and relationships. And because I'm getting my sex ed certification and there were all of these scientists and researchers from all over the world, Belgium, France, and one of them was talking about how mismatched desires will always occur at some point, no matter who you are as a person in and long-term relationships specifically. So this is really important because even if you think sometimes that this may not be you, or you're like, I've experienced that before, but now it's different at some point, no matter what, whether it's long-term or short-term mismatched desire will occur. And so this is really important. So that being said, and and they had a bunch of like research that I started like kind of my brain started feeling like it was going to explode from <laughs> all of the statistics that uh, and the the amazing research that has been conducted and more is always is is always coming and on the horizon people uh, get money. I think it's so it's fascinating. But that being said, let's get into the nitty gritty here. What skills do you think are most important for couples to learn so they can bring the sexy back and rekindle the flame that they had when there was the NRE? Yeah. Well, there's so many skills. I feel like I'm going to have to just cherry pick a couple. I think one of the most foundational skills is learning how to hear and say no and stay in connection. Because what happens is if you're overriding your no, you're going to start to resent sex or your partner or both. But when we say no, we often feel guilty. And when we hear no, we often feel rejected. And then disconnection happens. 
but we can hear and say no and stay in connection. And while there may be disappointment that happens because you're not actually maybe getting that one thing you really, really want, there isn't the feeling of rejection because the rejection comes from the disconnection, not from the no. And so saying something like, wow, I really think that's hot that you think that's hot and I'm not available for that right now. Let's see what else is on the table is a wonderful way to say no and to stay in connection and to redirect to what your yeses may be. Discovering what I often call the the Venn diagram of overlapping yeses. What are you into? What am I into? Let's see where it overlaps in this moment and let's play there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love uh, all of that uh, that you shared there and the the Venn diagram. I love the visuals too. It's like, and we talk about that too, the the yes, no, and maybes. And I love what you said, how it's not about the actual no, it's about the disconnect that follows that. Which can be difficult to address though, if if people are, are feeling that there's a harmful conversation that's being had, like what's wrong with me? Yeah. Are you saying that something's wrong with me? And that's why I think they're treading lightly over how to have those conversations. But I like, let's identify where our yeses are yeah. at. Are you comfortable with, are you a yes to having sex one time a week? Or are you a yes to having sex three times a week? Or are you a yes to having sex five times? And what is sex? Yeah. Can I just put my finger in your butt? <laughs> yeah. And then, and then the, I, I forgot who did this. It was the Gottman Institute, the bids or something where so I'm like, yeah, you've been, you, you're nodding your head. What's the bids? The bids is like, so hey, April, would you like to have a sexy evening with me tonight? And you're like, no, I'm good. And then you just turn down my bid. And it, but what, what I'm hearing Alice and Dr. Ali say is instead of no, I'm good. And here's what I am available for. It's not actually, you're not actually asking a lot uh, in terms of this reframe of how we can just add a little bit of like, well, I'm a no to this and here's what I'm open to. It sounds like what, and maybe you can confirm this probably goes a long way. It really does. Because I think when we hear a no period without any offer for something else, we do start to feel like something's wrong with me. Am I not desirable? Do they not want to be close to me? And and we can look at a snippet in time and think, oh yeah, this is an easy conversation to have. But when these moments have accrued over time and there's an accumulation of no's and lack of responses to bids for intimacy and feelings of the door being shut, then we get really sensitive to mm-hmm. it. And it, it's harder to stay in here, no and stay in connection when there is that scarcity experience, whether it's a mindset or a reality of a, of a lack of intimacy. And so that's one of the things that I think coaching is so helpful for, because when you're in it, when you're really stuck in the mud, oftentimes you need somebody else who's not in it to offer that helping hand to help you get unstuck. Yeah, definitely. And like, no's are powerful. They're, they're important. So we're not you know wanting to bypass the no. It's just like, what else can you add to it to make it? And it couldn't, it could also be, you know, if again, if it was like, April, would you like to have a, a sexy intimate night with me? And she's a, a no, she's, she could say no, but I'm, a, and I'm available for something that has nothing to do with sex or intimacy, That's right. right? I am, I'm available to have dinner with you. I'm available to sit on the couch for five minutes and connect. And that's kind of it. That's all I have today. I'm fucking exhausted and I love you and I want to connect with you. And when people think sex is work because they have that, I've I've slipped in that, into that rut before where I was so exhausted and I know my, my partner really wants um, not even sex, but just like something from me, like to be intimate. And I, I struggle and I have to say, look, Right now, I just I just need time for myself. And can we revisit this even in the morning when I have a good night's sleep? Because I am I'm just drained. And the thought of being sexual right now would be really hard for me. I can't drop in. And you don't want that, right? You want me to be at least horny and and ready for for action, or at least like able to be um, actually expressive of how I really feel. So deep eye gazing and and all of those things. And I think that you is, lost me a deep eye gazing. Yeah, <laughs> but like what's <laughs> <just me>, <laughs> And then, well, me too. I hate some I'm deep eye gazing. That, like, yeah, and here's yeah. what I'm available for. Yeah. Not that. Like stroking my hair. But that's the thing with kids, which is the next question. That can be really hard for, for folks. They're exhausted. That's right. And I think one of the other things that's really important to like a reframe that's really helpful. I like to give this idea of there's an intimacy bank. 
And we all have an account in the intimacy bank. And anytime you experience any intimacy, it could be 30 seconds passing each other in the hallway or 30 minutes more spaciously at night. It could be emotional connection. It could be physical affection. It could be sexual intimacy. Any time you have any intimacy at all, you're depositing into your intimacy bank account. And that's enriching the overall intimacy of your relationship. And it makes future sexual encounters that much more accessible. And so it reframes these experiences of 30 seconds in the hallway or a yummy kiss before we go to bed or a naked cuddle or whatever is on the table for you. It reframes that from a loss because it's not ending in penetrative sex or whatever the desire is to a win. And any intimacy experienced is a win. And that helps to really create the space for more intimacy. And you mentioned earlier, scheduling sex and the challenges of that. I I do think scheduling sex can really result in a lot of pressure, but I highly encourage people to schedule time for intimacy. Mm -hmm. And you can just explore whatever intimacy is available as you're having an an intimacy date and realizing that any intimacy experienced is a win because it's depositing in the intimacy bank. And then here is this other thing that we talked about in the very beginning, which is creating opportunities for desire to come online. And so if you're having an intimacy date, you're having a little bit of connection and you start to get more into your body. You feel more connected to yourself. You feel more connected to your your lover. You're getting out of the stressful mindset of your workday or parent role or whatever else it may be. And it creates opportunity for more desire to build. And then you can see, hmm, is there something else that we're ready to explore as as like scaffolding? How do we get from here to there? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like baby steps or walking in little stepping stones instead of trying to take the big leap there. Like we got to go from here to there instead, like those little pieces that might not even feel like they're having to do with sex, but they can get to this other place and they might not too. And that's okay. You mentioned the thing uh, in April did too, about with kids and we don't have kids. I don't, we have fur babies. I mean, so for, we love our fur babies. So this is not our area of expertise. And yet we have hosted a lot of folks that have spoken about sex and parenting or relationships and parenting. And I know a lot of people who are like, oh, my, you know, I mean, yeah, we have a lot of friends who are like, yeah, it's a lot. And I, under- like, I haven't had sex with my partner in a year. Yeah. Is that OK? Yeah. Because they have a baby. And I'm like, you know, I, I it's, is it OK for you? Yeah. I, I, I don't know. Is and it OK I, for your partner? Yeah. And I understand kind of like the maternal piece of if my energy is going to like raising this child and that's a lot of energy and maybe even even the paternal piece too. Right? It's not just that. But like, I think, you know, the person birthing the child there, you kind of like switch this something switches in your brain for a lot of folks where it's just like all this energy going here so at the end of the day the energy to come outward to engage my partner even if it's not sex intimacy connection can feel like a lot and but but for me when i hear that i'm like but do you scroll on facebook do you go on instagram Mm -hmm. you know do you watch a netflix show because if you have that you have some capacity for some form of connection it might not be sex but anyways so in your expert opinion having kids as we know can be challenging for maintaining sexual intimacy or um, or just intimacy in general. So what are some things that could be really helpful for parents to consider to, to keep that? And I, maybe just, it's what you just said, but do you have anything else for like the parenting piece? Sure, yeah. I think one of the things that's helpful is permission. Permission for sex to look different, for it to feel different. Especially, I think for for women who have given birth, your body is going to change, your erogenous zones will change. And that oftentimes requires exploration of what feels good now and permission for that to look different. I also think that it can be really hard to get out of that parent mindset. The parent role is very consuming. And even when the kids to bed and you might have like part of your brain tracking for the noises or (laughs) or are we going to wake them up or, you know, all of that. And so having rituals or habits or a way of moving from parent role into sexual, sensual prioritization of yourself kind of a mindset. And oftentimes that requires doing something that helps you get embodied, putting on some music and dancing for a little bit, taking a bubble bath, getting a massage, uh, something that helps you start to feel your own sensual self. And I think the other thing is just acknowledging the very real constraints that having children, especially young children, creates in terms of time and energy levels. And so 
I really think that the two parent model that our society has created is so damaging for parents and for kids. And we need community support. And for folks out there that don't have the finances to hire babysitters and nannies and all of that, doing uh, childcare swaps with your friends where they take your baby for at least a few hours and then you do that one night a week, or if you're lucky to have family nearby, not being shy about getting the support that you need so that you can carve out some time for yourself and for you and your partner. And I think remembering that it's important, this isn't just for parents, it's for everybody, that you need to cultivate your own pleasure. And so if you're not attending to self-pleasure practices, and that may be masturbation, but it could simply be um, anything that's sensory-based pleasure, that you're prioritizing pleasure because pleasure, any pleasure awakens the pleasure centers of the brain. And so investing on that in a solo way will help you invest in that with your partner. Oh, yeah. I just thought when you talked about the sensory stuff that happens when you're a parent, like new parent specifically, but it can, it can roll over into many years. And I, we, we both have lots of friends with, with kids. And I just remember, I don't even know how many of my friends were glued to the baby monitor. Some of them until the kid was three. And when I, when you said dancing and I just thought about, maybe getting a second monitor that's not for babies that your partner can watch you do sexy dances and the that's monitor be like hey 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 how do you like me now baby sleep in we, we went down to um la and hung out with my friend recently yes. and her her approach and i'm not we're not saying we, again that we are not giving advice on like parenting and how to how to like monitor not monitor your kid but her approach was so like I'm going to live my life still. Right. Like, I'm going to be a good parent, but like, I'm going to live. Still. Right. And we're like, yes, it's so nice here. And then the other piece with that is, I think a lot of people think it's selfish to choose this role. Like, oh, oh, I need, my pleasure is important or my, my joy or something. But, and I have this young child here, but so if I choose me, I'm being a bad parent there's or I'm being a, selfish. There's so much judgment amongst parents. I've because I'm pretty much a Switzerland when it comes to parenting for people, they'll tell me like, well, my friend did this and that's just, I would never do that. And I'm like, whoa, judge Judy, that's okay. Like if that works for them, their kid seems to be fine. And we're not here telling anyone to do any specific thing, but get creative. That's always fun. And I think that baby monitor thing for adults is like genius right now. I'm just like (laughs) about to trademark that shit. Um, So I I love this conversation because that's, exactly where my brain went with the baby (laughs) monitors and my friends like I'd be over for a glass of wine and I'm like bro you got to put the baby monitor down for 20 minutes we can have a conversation your baby's clearly sleeping (laughs) oh wait she just she just rolled over I'm like it's all good I think babies do that right (laughs) um so so I am also fascinated by this debit credit intimacy account bank 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 account so let's say let's give you a little scenario here that uh you've been You've you've been taking a lot of you've been debiting a lot from that bank account, the intimacy bank account. You're debiting and maybe it's getting below the zero balance and shit is hitting the fan. You're like, okay, shit's hitting the fan. We're in negative here with the intimacy banking. We haven't done shit with, with for ourselves. What can couples do when things go completely awry? Mm-hmm. I think it's about orienting around what is available. And oftentimes that's emotional connection before physical connect affection, before sexual intimacy. That's a, one of the scaffolding structures I like to talk about. So emotional connection. Can you share some affirmations for each other? What you appreciate about one another and how it impacts you? Some gratitudes for those of you out there who like it. Deep eye gazing. Anything that helps you feel Uh, Maybe it's even just sharing your highs and lows from the week or um, offering each other empathy uh, for something that they've been uh, working through that's been hard. Just feeling that experience of being seen and understood and celebrated and known by your partner. Then exploring some physical affection, a really long hug. It takes about 30 seconds for the brain to release oxytocin, which is that yummy cuddle hormone. And so that's fast. That's not, yeah. You have time for that, everyone. You have time. That's right. (laughs) But the reality is most hugs are not 30 seconds. What kinds of skin to skin contact can you create? And I think one of the things that's really challenging here is that if desire feels completely inaccessible, couples oftentimes don't want to explore physical affection because they are afraid it's going to get their partner really excited and they don't want to lead them on or have to say a no. And so oftentimes physical affection 
goes out the window because it feels risky to do that because then it's going to open up tender, painful terrain. And I think that if we can remember the intimacy bank and if we can feel comfortable completing saying this was really yummy this was really nourishing and I'm feeling full or and I'm really tired if we can feel comfortable with that and welcome each other's no's while still being available for the yeses it reduces the cost of exploring physical affection and maybe some of the lower rungs of the scaffolding of sexual intimacy like a long hot makeout or something like that and again that's just actually creating the opportunity for more desire to come online and just for the two of you to feel closer over the long run. I, I also think that giving reassurances, I'm just excited to connect with you in whatever way feels available, or this is really yummy. I miss how your skin feels against me. Like affirming what is the yes and how much you're enjoying it can also really help pave the way and lubricate the situation. And then I think the other thing that's really necessary is to name the elephant in the room. I think this is one of the most important things I work with my couples around is if there is an emotional experience, a thought, a fear that you are having, and you are trying to navigate it on your own or hide it, that increases a feeling of isolation and disconnection. And so oftentimes when things are going awry, if you just name the elephant in the room, then the two of you can address it. You can maybe offer some of that reassurance or permission or support, empathy around it. Maybe there's a calibration or tweak that can be made that then makes things better. Uh, I want to close the blinds. I'm worried that the neighbors are going to see. I'm feeling self-conscious or whatever it is, right? I just want to make sure that the baby monitor is on. So if the baby cries, I'll be able to hear them. Whatever is the whatever is that thing to be able to name that, because again, even if that means that you switch from a sexy space to more of an emotional connection space, it's still enriching the overall intimacy in your relationship. I had a, a question about the kind of following up with April asked when shit hits the fan and we'll get to more like the preventative measures of what couples can do in a second. But so first of all, everyone, Allison, Dr. Allison Ash, Dr. Allie works with uh, clients privately. And I've had uh, a couple of friends that worked with you and they didn't, it wasn't about parenting and kids, but it was, you know, within their relationship structure, they said it was very, very helpful. So I'm um, just putting that out there too. And when is the point when you, when shit hits the fan so much that, you should seek outside support. Like, how do you know in a relationship, wow, this is, we're trying all these things. We've tried some of them and we just keep staying stuck in this disconnected space or we're not having sex or whatever. How do they know? Okay. Yeah. We need, we need help. I love this question. And I think the reality is, is that I wish folks would seek out support about five steps before shit hits the fan because when shit has already hit the fan, of course, support is helpful and, and necessary, but there are, is so much more I can do with couples when they come early before all of the hurt and the resentment and the rejection and the wounding and the builds up in a cruise. And, and then you have to really process and repair all of that emotional challenges before you can really get to feeling like you can implement some of the practical strategies. And so I would say if you're in a place of feeling chronic disconnection, if you're feeling stuck and you're not sure what to try next, if you're wanting to enrich your overall intimacy and you're feeling like you don't know where to turn or the things you're trying aren't working, if you're stuck in kind of patterns, and those are some indication signs that outside support can really help shift the dynamic in a, a positive way before you get stuck in that deep rut that feels like shit hit the fan, as you've said. And, you know, when I'm working with couples earlier in the process, oftentimes it's a shorter coaching relationship because they need less support. And so oftentimes that's, that's just, it's a better situation. This is like on the, the bank, the, the investing in your bank or the piggy bank thing, or however you were wording it. It, like what you're saying, if you wait till the shit hits the fan, it's going to take a lot more time, probably some more money too, if you're, if you're seeking outside support, as opposed to being preventative. So yeah, it's, but that's not how a lot of people, people in finance operate. are stoked right now. They're yeah, like, I'm, an accountant. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to figure out how much intimacy debits and credits I've done and what the costing is <laughs> yeah. on this feel good. I'm, <laughs> yes. I'm going to spreadsheet this out. I'm going to share this Excel file with my partner. Yeah. It'd be great. Yeah. I think that's, uh, yeah. Well, yeah, you do you. That's probably helpful. April will get a PowerPoint. She's like, 
like exhibit A. I'd get my laser pointer out. Yeah. I'd be stoked. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, and just one other question on that and then we will move on. Uh, sure. But we think we've asked this maybe to you or other people, but this happens a lot. What if one partner is like, shit hit the fan or we're having a hard time and the other one's like, we're fine. Everything's fine. I'm fine. Or this is just how it is. This is how I am. Or just unwilling. No, no, no. Therapy. Like April said, says often like people think you're broken if you go to therapy. Like, oh, that means mm-hmm. we really have a problem. But one's like, no, we do. It's we- almost like admitting that they have a problem. They think it's like, but that. you do. So-, <laughs> like, oh. so what would you say for the partner that wants to do the work? And for, uh, you know, what would you say for them? Like how, because they can't make someone do a thing. Like, what do they do? That is a sticky and challenging situation. And oftentimes what I recommend is either one of two approaches. The person who's willing and available come to coaching. And sometimes coaching will start in a one-on-one dynamic. And then their partner sees the insights that they're getting and the support that they're receiving. And that can be incentivizing. And the other thing is to realize that even if you don't think we need it, if I think we need it, then you can come as a support to me. Oh, I like and that. Yeah. It's an investment in me, in my needs, in what I will want to feel more connected to myself, connected to you, less anxious, less stressed overall. And that's going to support our relationship. That's so smart. Genius. Yeah. I never heard, I haven't heard anyone say that. I, mean, I don't know. That's that like in, the request can be, okay, well, you're, you're a note of this or you don't think we need it, but I do. So can you come as my support for this? That's, mm-hmm. that's brilliant. That Dr. Is actually Alex. Quite smart. <laughs> it's so simple, but makes so much sense. Yeah. I love that. Mm-hmm. And that doesn't seem manipulative at all because you're asking for support from someone that you love that's involved in your relationship with you. So it actually makes a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. And Ah, that is good. Mind blown. Yeah. I, I, I'm just really, really. Um, okay. But what if they say no still? Sorry. Right. No, right. Right. That's true. That can happen. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I think sometimes there are, we talked about mismatched libidos, mismatched desires. There's sometimes mismatched orientations to the growth process mm. and what that requires in people's investment in that. And to realize that it's vulnerable, it requires courage not just courage to to go out there and try something new, but courage to acknowledge that things could be different or better. Courage to look at the ways that things haven't been working or maybe places where you feel shame for not having shown up in a way that your partner wants you to. And that requires some resiliency and some resourcing. I often say that self-growth is a luxury. And when we have zero capacity, it's one of the first things that goes out the window. And so it might also require some sort of lifestyle change so that you can free up the time, space, and energy to pursue self-growth work. It might require a recalibration of values and priorities around where you're going to invest time and money. And sometimes the reality is, is that this can be a, a deal breaker in the long run for couples when one person really wants to invest and the other person is completely resistant because then there's just that mismatch becomes greater. The divide becomes greater. And so, you know, we always want to honor resistance, get curious about resistance, see what's underneath and and informing the resistance, but there also needs to be movement towards each other. Yeah. One thing I've, I've found helpful because where, and where I grew up, isn't that important, but it is in a sense where I, therapy wasn't some an option for for a lot of people that I was surrounded with and even moving into my 20s and my 30s I never thought therapy or counseling as some folks call it was an option because that meant that something was really wrong when I switched the way that I framed that out in my brain and I said whoa, wait a second. Okay. Yes. It's my conditioning and I'm getting tools that are, it's like, I'm getting coaching to better myself. And anybody, if you know, Olympic athletes, they have coaches, even though they might be the top tier of the most impressive athlete at what they're doing in the world, they still have a coach, someone that may not even have their skill level anymore, but did, or knows what they're doing to bring them to the next level, to give them all of the the techniques and the tools to bring them to their end goal, which in this case would be having 
a, a really strong partnership that has deep intimacy and connection and sex to follow with your partner. So if you can reframe it, and also if you're not skilled at communicating with your partner in a way to help them reframe it, uh, have them listen to this episode and <laughs> or just put it on casually while you're, you know, vacuuming or, or doing gymnastics and say, wow, did you just hear that? It's, it's a way to get more tools in the tool belt to see a professional, to see someone that went to Stanford and to listen to what they have to say, like Dr. Allison Ash. And, and that's why you, you are only as good as some of the, the most impressive and most intellectual people in the world have great therapists alongside of that's them. That's right. That's right. I sure do. And I think the reality is, is that we need to realize that intimacy is a skill that is not modeled or templated for us in society at large. We don't learn it in our family systems. We don't learn it in our school systems. When we think about media and media, media representations and portrayals of intimacy, it is not well templated for us. And so any skill we can learn with proper instruction and practice, but you have to get access to that instruction and practice and modeling and templating. And I just want to normalize it that most people have challenges with, with intimacy because we don't have access to that. And so of course we need to get access to that. Like I think everybody needs that. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yep. Uh, agreed. Agreed. And a hundred percent agreed. Uh, and I, I like that what you said earlier, but like, yeah, the, the two parent model is a while ago. Like it's not really the best, most ideal. We talked about this with Kyle Tierman yeah. and we were on Kyle Tierman's show. He was talking about the nuclear family mm-hmm. and how it almost is set up for failure, right? It's like, you're isolated. You're in this big home. You that do you all on your own. And you're, yeah, yeah. And you're working really hard nine to five or, uh, or seven to 7 PM. And you don't really see the children that you wanted so deeply and badly with your partner. And Mm -hmm. you're just working and working and working. And this nuclear family idea is getting further and further away from, from it takes a village and it does. And, but see how that also can, that connects to it not being modeled for us. Like if we see just our parents, all they're doing is working hard to keep like the family going. We don't see their intimacy. We don't see their closest. We don't see them, uh, you know, sharing and, and speaking, communicating about, you know, their love, their fears, all those things. Things. And, and granted, of course, there's not, you don't want your kids to see all the things, but we're not getting, even getting that at home versus we see our, our parents in, in as hard as it is actually modeling these things. It would make a huge difference. And I know this isn't all about parenting everyone. So I'm going to bring it to a shiny place. I want a shiny place as we go out with a bang, speaking about banging. How do I keep this desire to bang my partner going strong? Like what are some of the fun things? I know a lot of these are fun, but like what are some things that couples can do to make in- intimacy sustainable over the long run? That's like, ooh, spicy. Yeah. <laughs> I think having regular intimacy dates and realizing intimacy dates are different than date nights where you maybe go out to dinner or the bar or a movie, whatever that may be. An intimacy date is where you're carving out time and spaciousness to connect with each other. One of the things that I like to work with my couples to create is an intimacy menu of different ways that you can connect emotionally, physically, sexually, things that are sensory based, sensual, and to be able to pick from the menu and to decide what you're both a yes to do that for a little while, then pick the next thing and do that for a little bit. And it helps you create opportunities for desire, but it also helps you attune to yourself and to each other. It helps you learn how to discover yeses and redirect towards what's available. And it also creates permission for you to complete whenever you're feeling full, but you have to schedule it and consistency is key show up, realize that showing up for your intimacy dates is an investment in the relationship. Simply showing up is a deposit in your intimacy bank. It is a win. And I think it's celebrating wins, especially small wins, creating those scaffolding structures of, okay, we want to have hot sex. Maybe what we can do tonight is just get naked and touch each other on the peripheries of our body and just explore uh, some sensual massage. And then maybe next time we'll uh, escalate, escalate a little bit if that feels like it's on the table, but that's still a win. And so realizing that intimacy is not always sex. And I think shaking up routines is really important. Trying to do different things, different places, different ways, different soundtracks, right? Like playlists. It's about really shaking up the routines as much as possible. And you can create anticipation for the intimacy dates throughout the week. 
So doing that with your words of affirmation, I'm really excited to spend some time with you tomorrow night. I'm really looking forward to dropping into connection. You can do that with like a gift giving or active service, creating that central playlist or getting a new toy or making the room look really nice or getting some soft yummy sheets on the bed. Uh, you can do that by dropping in a little flyby physical affection and wooing. You're passing each other in the hallway and you just like grab each other's butts or one of you is washing the dishes and the other one comes up behind and kind of holds and supports like it's about thinking about what are the tiny little moments that you can do in between intimacy dates that are also deposits in your intimacy bank that can create anticipation and uh, shared mutual prioritization and investment yeah i love all of this and i think that just to tell everyone out there shamelessly it's it's not easy by any means even for folks like and i won't speak for uh, dr ali and and i won't speak for amy but i'll speak for myself like i am in this work all the time and i learn these these beautiful skills from um, amazing experts like dr ali and i still have to work on it like my partner is obsessed with sports right and i am so busy right now that i tend to, I tend to shut down at a certain point where I'm like, I just can't. And, or he's watching football and I'm like, I'm kind of horny right now, but he is so fucking invested in the game. And I'm like, Oh my God, really? Oh, okay, bro. And I'd like, sometimes <laughs> I find myself being like, Hmm, this would be the perfect time for me to be intimate. Cause I actually am charged up. So it is finding the timing as well, but I, I will write him nice messages while I'm in the other room, not watching the football game. He really wants me to love sports and I try. Okay. I try, but I don't know if any therapy can help me with that, but I'm like, <laughs> I just, I don't know. Uh, so timing is everything. And, and again, the desire discrepancy will arise and summertime, I feel like is never that like is not as intense as when the fall and the winter comes and you're sort of there's more darkness and and like when football season starts when, exactly <laughs> what I was getting at where I'm like oh football's on again I thought basketball just ended Did let's just do football oh, okay. <laughs> I have nothing against sports everyone I love it I do I think it's great that I think she likes it I don't the, know if she loves the, it yes I, I I'm I'm happy that people enjoy it. And yes. So my point though, was that there's no perfect equation, right? There's no perfect thing that's going to work or one size fits all, but it is adapting. And that's why it's important to seek support. And you're only as, as supported as those that are around you that really can give you the tools that you need. So that's why it's important to call on folks like Dr. Ali and that brings me to that was a shameless admission. You know, sometimes my intimacy can can uh, peter off as well. So, Wait, have you ever I tried to, in front of the TV to, pre- walking, to unplug it? To no, no, unplug no, it no, no. Like, oh, no, something's wrong. No, 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 no I haven't oh, tried. Okay, that. maybe yeah. Then you walk by and you're wearing like some little booty shorts and you just like walk by and drop something. I have an 86- Hinge television. Okay. You so can't block that shit. You can't fucking block it. And, <laughs> hey, babe, you're all ass in the way. It's in the way. So it's like, hey, what are you doing? Get, yeah, I could be as naked as I wanted. All right. It has. Yes. My yes. Yeah. But good, good with question. 80s, with, that, with that big of a TV with, and how tiny you are, there's no yeah. way that you could block the TV. It's it impossible. <laughs> yeah. It absorbs me in the TV. <laughs> so, um, but I, I, I will try different things. But like, I think this light bulb's broken over here. Oh, oh, the TV is not working now. Oh no, oh, but that would be, I wouldn't, I, that's mean. Um, I won't do that. Okay. So, um, but speaking of working with, I don't know if you're actually accepting any new clients because I know you're such a busy human, but I know you do have some upcoming offerings that are really hot off the press, right? So this episode comes out and, and it's uh, very soon. So everyone can jump on that, but how can folks find your offerings? And also if they want to work with you, if you are accepting, um, new clients, uh, where can they reach uh, Dr. Allison Ash? Yeah, so my website is turnon.love and you can find out about all of my offerings and coaching practice there. My partner is also an intimacy coach. We have a practice together. And so I am accepting new clients. My practice is pretty full, but I do have a few more spots open and my partner has some spots available and we always collaborate on care together. And so I think that that is a wonderful way to get support from two different folks who have different trainings, different insights, but still work together. It's um, yeah, a really comprehensive way to to get that coaching. And then I also, we're teaching our sustainable intimacy, reignite the flame for the long game 
course, which starts in October. It's a month long course for couples. We're going to dive into all of the topics that we talked about today and more. And then I'm teaching my annual sexual and emotional intimacy skills course in January, which is an eight week course for individuals and couples. And uh, I have a promo for all of you shameless sex listeners out there. Love shameless sex will give you a hundred dollars off either the sustainable intimacy course or sexual and emotional intimacy skills, which starts in January. And then I also have a wide range of on-demand workshops. I think almost 15 different on-demand workshops are available at this point. So you can rent them from home anytime that you'd like. So if you're curious about coaching, reach out for a con complimentary consultation or go to my website for my live and on-demand offerings. Do they just mention shameless sex to get the hundred dollars off or there well, is a promo code area and you would write love shameless sex one word and that uh, will give you a hundred off. And this is off just the January course or the October course too? Both courses. Both courses. Okay, cool. Yeah. Awesome. Exciting. And you and I you have so many other pieces there. Like if people can't make these uh, workshops because they are kind of set in the timing that it's happening, right? You have so, like you said, you have all these other offerings, and I yeah again highly recommend people um, working with directly with Dr. Ali uh, and haven't met your partner yet, but I'm sure your partner is awesome. If it's your partner, your partner that person is awesome, and uh, and then taking your courses because you really are uh, an, an incredible human being, an incredible resource, uh, and I also just really love how you speak to most or all people, you know, I hearing you speak, I felt like, okay, it could be regardless of gender orientation, uh, monogamy or, or non-monogamy, all these pieces, you're speaking to all those people. So wherever you are in some form of long-term relationship or your own personal growth, go check out Dr. Ali's work at turnon.love. Did I say that right? Turnon.love? You yeah, sure yes. did. Yeah. And <laughs> if you're single and you're not in a relationship, reach out as well, because we work with both individuals and couples. Everybody wants and needs intimacy, support, and help. And so, yeah. you know, wherever you're at, we're going to meet you there. And if you're a single, when you get into a relationship, then you'll have some of these tools that you can you can start off on a, on a great uh, foot with your new partner mm -hmm. uh, by having these things to be like, I need this intimacy bank that I'm going to put on a whiteboard uh, here in the house and we can check out when we, when we debit or credit. Um, and that here's my PowerPoint. And here's my PowerPoint <laughs> presentation. Uh, wait, don't leave. No, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> wait, 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 we're bringing up. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Dr. Ali Ash, everyone. And thank you to our beautiful shameless sex listeners. We just adore each and every one of you. You're so important to us. And Ah, every Tuesday, we release a new episode. Occasionally, we have a bonus episode. Remember, Shameless Sex, the book, it's out November 14th, but pre-order your hardcover copy now. There's way, way more beautiful information. We read the Audible version cover to cover, Amy and I, and I was fucking cracking up. And the director and the engineer both dudes, penis owners that are in relationships said that they learned so much from the book while we were reading it. And I felt so grateful. So get your copy now because we have a little special, uh, very provocative, but uh, amazing workshop that is for anyone that pre-orders. So shamelesssex.com for that. And we will see you next Tuesday. Ah, ciao for now.